Here we are back in Phylum Nidaria, taking a look at one of the classes, Class Anthozoa. Now this Anthozoa, if you've been watching my videos in order and you've already done plants, you might be thinking, Anthozoa, I remember learning about Anthophyta. So if you remember, Phyta is referring to plants and Antho refers to flower. And so Class Anthozoa is flower animal, which sounds really cute when you put it that way. Uh, so flower animal is really referring to the sea anemones and coral, where you have this stalk and then you have all of the tentacles facing upward, giving it that flower-like appearance. So shout out to our flowering plants and you've made yourself known again, um, talking about our sea anemones. So when thinking about the organisms found in class Anthozoa, we pretty much have two big categories of organisms. We have our sea anemones, like you see here on the left. And of course, you can't have a picture of sea anemones without clownfish. And these, we refer to them as solitary, meaning like you look at a sea anemone and maybe there's others around it. But for the most part, like they kind of grow on their own. They're solitary. The other group of organisms that we find in class Anthozoa is coral. And coral is referred to as a colonial organism. So it's always found with other coral polyps. And a coral polyp, if you look at the zoomed in picture, is just a sea anemone, but it's a lot shorter. And coral is always growing with other coral uh, to create a coral reef, which we'll talk more about soon in a second. But both types of organisms, whether we're talking about anemones or we're talking about coral, are in a polyp form. And all organisms found within class Anthozoa only exist in the polyp form. They do not have a medusa form anywhere in their life cycle. So whether they're colonial or solitary, doesn't really matter. What ties them together is that they're fully in a polyp form. So the organism I'd really like to focus on for class Anthozoa is taking a look at coral. One, you're probably more familiar with coral, and two, there's some big changes happening in our environment that are making a big impact to coral. So let's talk about when I say coral, what exactly am I referring to and what's the difference between coral and a coral reef? And I'll be honest, like they're pretty similar. So when we're talking about coral, when I'm talking about the animal, coral, I'm referring to a single polyp, right? It is its own individual organism. It gets its own food. It deals with its own waste. It by itself is its own animal. So when we talk about coral, we mean coral, the animal, the squishy little animal that has little tentacles and tries to sting you, but too small to really do it. And then you have a coral reef. And a coral reef is made up of tons of these coral. I mean, if you look at this picture, this might be what you imagine when you think of coral. Here you can see those individual polyps. They're all living next to each other, but they all live on like this 3D structure, this reef structure as we call it. I don't know if you've ever thought about it, but like what's underneath the polyps? So the polyp itself is not hard. The polyps are soft and squishy. The reef they're sitting on though is incredibly hard, but that is not a living coral. So let me kind of describe the, the reef or that physical structure a little bit more. So let's start with the text and then I'll talk about the image. So coral, the polyp, the organism, the individual thing is gonna take two things out of the water. So it's always ingesting water and it's getting the nutrients and stuff it needs out of it, not dissimilar to us. And the two things it's really trying to grab out of the water are calcium ions and carbonate ions. And if you've taken chemistry and you also wanna know what those are, that's Ca2 plus is the calcium ion and CO3 two minus is our carbonate ion. And what coral can do is when they've taken those nutrients, they can create a compound called calcium carbonate or CaCO3. You may have heard of calcium carbonate before. It's pretty much what sidewalk chalk is made out of. It's what a lot of seashells are made out of. Um, it's what's found in Tums um, and some other medicines, particularly for an upset stomach. But it's this chalky substance. But if put together in the right way, it can actually be a really hard, almost skeleton-like 
And I say skeleton, like, I don't want you to think your bones are calcium carbonate, though we do have calcium and other compounds, but it creates a really hard, rigid surface. So looking at this image to kind of connect coral and then this calcium carbonate. So this green, very light green image is of a single coral polyp, that living jelly-like, waving its tentacles around, living its life. But you'll notice this kind of blue brick texture you see is that calcium carbonate deposit. So it's creating calcium carbonate and kind of excreting it below itself. So you see the tentacles are still out in the air, kind of waving around, and then they're kind of depositing that calcium carbonate below it. And then you don't really need to know this, but in case you're curious, when the coral wants to release more, the coral will kind of stretch a little bit and then deposit more. And it actually, even the bottom of the coral will move up and fill in the space below it too and then fills it more with calcium carbonate. So it's essentially just creating the skeleton structure, but it's not a skeleton in the way you and I think of skeletons. This is not inside the coral. You can almost think of it like it's building a home for itself. Your house is providing you protection. It's made out of hard materials to keep you safe, but you and your house are not the same organism. Now this is really important because these coral reefs are really complex, right? A lot of shapes, um, sizes, different colors. And they actually provide a great habitat for fish like you see in this picture. But even more importantly, even if I'm not a coral reef fish and I spend my whole lifetime there, they can serve as really powerful protectors of many fish species in the egg laying stage and in the juvenile stage. If you haven't seen Finding Nemo, I'm about to give you a spoiler so you can skip ahead if you need to. If, you know, Marlin and his wife, whose name I don't remember, if they had just laid their eggs in a coral reef, it probably would have been safe and Nemo would have brothers and sisters. That's all I'm saying. Coral reefs serve as a really important hideaway for fish species globally. And coral reefs also aren't just in the tropics. Uh, they're found in cold water environments as well. All right, so that kind of explains coral and coral reef, and that's going to be important here soon. Now let's take a look at a closer look at a coral polyp. So here's a super zoomed in picture of what a single, or I guess technically there's a couple in here, um, but what individual coral polyps look like. Now, kind of like jellyfish, polyps are clear, and you can kind of see that in the top part where the tentacles are. But if you've ever imagined a coral reef, you don't think of a clear coral. You think of oranges and browns and greens and, and yellows and all these different colors. And that color is part of the coral, but it's also not at the same time. You can see in this coral polyp that there's like this greenish brown color in it. But that greenish brown color is not coral. It's not coral making that color. It's something called zooxanthellae. Zooxanthellae are dinoflagellates that live in a mutualism with other animals. So that zoo is referring to animals and the xanth is referring to pigment. Um, now, zooxanthellae is probably most famous, so to speak, with corals, but there are other organisms that also have zooxanthellae that give them coloring as well. But coral is probably the most famous example, maybe most common. So zooxanthellae, because they're dinoflagellates, they photosynthesize. That's kind of why they have those pigments, to capture those sun rays, excite the pigment, turn that into usable energy. They're photosynthesizers. Well, remember, coral is an animal. And we have this photosynthesizer who's going to make what? It's going to make glucose, so food. It's going to make oxygen, which is needed to breathe. Now, coral doesn't breathe the same way, but they still need oxygen. They still need to create ATP. So coral is essentially getting a direct food source from the byproducts of photosynthesis. Zooxanthellae are going to benefit by getting the carbon dioxide that the coral releases in respiration. It also gets a safe home. Now, even though coral is not that large, it's larger than the dinoflagellate, 
it has tentacles. So that dino flagellate, if it was just a single-celled organism swimming around in the water, is more likely to die versus if it's in a coral, it's more likely to live. This is also why a lot, not all, but a lot of corals are found near the surface of the water because you need to photosynthesize. Again, it's not the coral photosynthesizing, it's the zooxanthellene. Now, this is all good and all, and you might be like, okay, like, why do I care <laughs> what color they are or why they're that color? Because this relationship is so critical. If a coral doesn't have zooxanthellae, it's not really able to get enough food for itself. It's just not really good <laughs> as an organism, as a, as a solo organism. If it didn't, if it was a clear coral polyp and had no zooxanthellae, it could probably only live for about three to six months. So this is a pretty crucial relationship uh, between the zooxanthellae and this coral. All right, so here, let's enter in the problem. Is there something going on called coral bleaching? And so before we even talk about what it causes, let's talk about what it actually is. So on the left, here is a picture of a nice, healthy coral. The coral polyps all have their zooxanthellae. Everything's happy. Here on the right is a bleached coral, and it's called bleached not because someone poured bleach on it, though that would probably cause this, but because when we bleach something, that usually means like we're trying to make it white. So calcium carbonate, that shell that coral makes, is white. It's just you usually don't see that because that white skeleton is covered in coral polyps. Now, when those coral polyps lose their zooxanthellae, which is what happens in coral bleaching, when it loses its zooxanthellae, all you see are the clear polyps. So you just see through the polyp into the white skeleton that's underneath. So this bleached reef right here has still thousands or millions of polyps on it. It's just they're clear now. So you can see that skeleton. So let's talk about how do they come clear. So when coral, the animal gets stressed, when they get pissed off at the world, they're like, screw you, Zuzanthelli. I'm going to expel you. I hate you. I don't want you in my life. I'm hungry. I'm scared. I'm too hot or I'm too cold or it's too salty or it's too fresh. Like they're having, honestly, it's coral having a temper tantrum. They are unhappy with things. And even though Zuzanthelli is good for it, coral, it just doesn't want to maintain any relationships. You know, this sounds a lot like humans, right? They don't want to maintain any relationships. They get rid of their zooxanthellae and they just kind of brood in their sadness. This can be temporary. If whatever condition kind of pissed off those coral polyps uh, finishes or passes, it will start grabbing dinoflagellates out of the water again and everything will go on as normal. The problem is, is if they're bleached too long. Remember earlier when I say that coral without zooxanthellae can probably only live three to six months? Well, if they bleach for three to six months, you might kill that coral permanently. If they don't get their zooxanthellae back, they just won't live. They won't be able to get enough food. And the reason this matters, kind of going to this picture up here, is that calcium carbonate skeleton, again, it's not like our bones. It is softer. Um, it is easier to break apart. Not easy, but easier than bone. And so if you don't have coral actively sitting on it, actively putting new layers of new, fully farmed, fresh calcium carbonate, what happens is this left behind skeleton starts eroding away, just like rocks in the water. But this is habitat for thousands of species, either directly entire life or indirectly just during the reproduction phase. And even though I think environment is important for environment's sake, that's really important to think about in economic terms too. Humans eat a lot of fish species where part of their life cycle depends on coral reefs. So humans are causing issues with ourselves, right? We want the fish, but now we're killing the fish. And I say we. Bleaching can be natural. For example, if we have an El Nino year, waters are warmer than typical, that can cause bleaching events. But humans can also contribute to bleaching events. One thing we're doing is we're adding more carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. 
when that carbon dioxide mixes in water, it becomes carbonic acid. Um, and it does a couple different things to ions, but essentially it slows down and breaks down growth in calcium carbonate. Ocean warming or ocean cooling. Again, coral is finicky. They just want to be stable. They don't want things to change. So they get pissed easily. Again, with climate change, some areas of the world are getting warmer and some are getting cooler. Pollution. So thinking about uh, a really big one at the Great Barrier Reef in Australia is um, sun suntan lotions and, and sunblocks that a lot of them contain chemicals that stress out and potentially even directly kill corals. So different types of water pollution. So again, short-term coral bleaching is natural. Um, it can be recovered. But if humans continue to make these huge, wide sweeping changes to our climate, we're going to see bleaching happen a lot more, a lot more frequently, a lot longer, which is also going to lead to ultimate coral death. And that's going to be devastating, not just to our ecosystems, but also to human economies, especially those that rely on fish. So sorry to show you these really cool pictures of coral reefs and then I go doom and gloom, um, but I think it's really important to understand these really cool organisms that exist on Earth and how humans kind of make an impact on them. But that's kind of good news, right? Humans are doing bad things, but that also means humans can fix those problems, right? We can prevent coral bleaching. We can, we can reverse those effects. So hopefully there might be some future marine biologists watching this, and maybe you want to dedicate your work and your research to help conserve those corals. Feel free in the comments if you want to explore more about ocean acidification or climate change and their impacts of corals. We can definitely explore that topic more.